You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. All right, so we got my man, Les Spellman, in the building. How we doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. So we got a very special project coming out called The Speed Code. So I'm a vertical jump expert, agility expert, injury prevention. Uh, but I have one area that I never really studied, and that is speed development, linear speed, speed mechanics, that kind of stuff. And so I went on a quest to find the best in the world. I'm trying to find, okay, who can compliment me in this area? And I came across Les Spellman and I reached out to him. I said, look, let's collab. Let's make something big. I mean, he trains NFL players, Olympic athletes. I'm doing it big on the NBA side. And so I feel like if we connected and came out with one thing together, it could take over all sports. And so we're coming out with the speed code. So I just wanted to introduce you guys to Les and uh, get, let's get your background story. Yeah, for sure. Well, I appreciate it, man. This is, um, I was a fan of yours even before I came out here, just seeing you do everything. And, you know, I was like, man, I, I wish I could dunk. Like I, you know, <laughs> I tell everybody in high school I could dunk, but I probably would just like touch and rim. So <laughs> I, um, you know, I'm a consumer of your content. Like I love it. So yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, it's been um, it's been a journey for me. I started out in high school as a pretty average athlete. I think I was on JV my junior year for like half the year. Like I was, <laughs> I was just average. And um, I remember my mom sitting down and being like, um, "I don't think you should play sports anymore. Like, I think you should just focus on school and get good grades because you don't project out to be a, a college athlete." My sister was a four sport high school athlete, um, varsity, all four sports, two two um, two sports she had offers for in college. So like. It was just a completely different thing. My my brother was six foot seven, um, it is six foot seven, basketball player, beast. Jeez. So I was the only one in the family that was like not good at sports. So anyway, like get through my junior year, senior year comes. Um, I'm in a high speed car accident, break my femur. So when I broke my femur, doctors came in the room and they're like, Les, like you're not gonna walk. Um, if you do walk, you're gonna have a cane and you're never gonna be able to run. It's not possible. Like you have screws in your and you're above your knee, your screws above your hip, you're gonna be in debil debilitating pain if you try to run or try to put force in the ground. Wow. So at that point I was like, all right, bet, <laughs> like, let me figure this thing out. So I went through a phase where I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna listen to the doctors, I'm gonna chill, whatever. And then I actually started reading some books and I was like, you know what, I think I can figure this thing out. Like I think I can actually dive in and figure it out. So long story short, 18 months later, I walked on to my division one track team. Wow. And um, that process right there was like, all right, number one, I learned how to manifest something that I wanted um, and a goal that I wanted. And number two was like, dang, like if I can go from nothing to running division one, like how far can I go? Mm -hmm. So I went to college, ran track a couple of years and I plateaued. Like I was not getting faster in college. And I thought if I go to college, run track, I'm going to be like an Olympian. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> the growth that I had from not walking to running. I was thinking I was going to have that same growth jump, mm -hmm. get to college. And I'm like, um, to go to my strength coach. Like, how do I get faster? He's like, uh, squat more. I'm like, okay, bet. get my squat crazy high. Um, you know, come back to him. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually the same speed. Mm -hmm. He's like, all right, we'll get flexible. So I go back, <laughs> I do yoga every day. <laughs> I get a little bit faster, but not much. So I go through this cycle of frustration for years and years and years. And, um, just, you know, ended up in injury, 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 injury. So I was like, there has to be more, there has to be more. So after college, I did a little short thing with rugby where I um, tried to cross over and make the Olympic team. Didn't happen. I was pretty average. I was fast, but I was average at, at, at the sport. So when I crossed over, I went to the Olympic training center, spent some time there. And for the first time I'm around USA biomechanics, I'm around some of the fastest people in the world. And for the first time, like I'm in a space where I'm not the best athlete, you know, like in, in college, I, I became a really good athlete and I get there and I'm like at the bottom all over again, mm -hmm. like high school. So for me, it was a process of trying to learn again and trying to study again, met some good people. Eventually when I, you know, got to the end of my road in rugby, I was like, you know what? I think I want to focus a hundred percent of my attention on helping people and actually teaching people what I learned in that 18 month process to walking 
or to running and then from running to actually getting a little bit faster. So I dived into some research and started studying everything that I could. I read every book that I could and uh, spent a lot of energy on just developing myself. Just like for the first time, there was no pressure. I'm not trying to make a team. Like I'm literally just out there practicing, 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 and things started to click. So over the past couple of years, I, I went from, you know, coaching kids in the park to coaching five Olympic teams to coaching over 100 guys for the NFL. Um, we have 50 guys in the league now, a couple number one picks, a couple Heismans. So, you know, it's been a journey, but it started out just very average, very basic. Like I was, I, you couldn't pick me out of a crowd. Mm -hmm. And I was very rarely being called a good athlete until I was older. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been. That's it's what's great. That's, that's why we connect well is because we have almost the same story. Yep. Uh, mine was not as drastic of an injury like yours. You were at the bottom, bottom. You may not like walk and run again. Mine was just a terrible, um, ankle tear. I mean, I tore some ligaments in my ankles and doctor said, you're gonna have to find something else. Like maybe you can get into endurance sports. So you're not going to jump again. Right, right. And then for me is the same thing. It's like, okay, bet. Right. Like, l l let me figure this out. Um, and then developed my athleticism. And, and I feel like a lot of people who become the best trainers just went through the most struggle right. as an athlete. <laughs> right. And it's like they had to overcome that. And because of that, you know, we had to study more. Right. It wasn't given to us. Right. It wasn't like genetics. It was like we had to figure it out. And so I feel like that's probably why uh, we connect so well is we have a very similar story. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and then same thing for me is like, okay, now I have this knowledge. What do I do? Well, let me just go to parks. Let me just sneak into this apartment gym and train some kids for free <laughs> right. and just for keep on going, keep on going. And then eventually everybody, you know, uh, eventually starts to find you and it starts to get to the high, the, right. the big guys. Uh, your name starts coming up on ESPN. So yeah. it's it's pretty crazy how it happens. Yeah. Um, so talk about your journey of kind of making that leap. You're you're at the Olympic Training Center. Are you working with uh, Olympians there? Yeah. Yeah. So I was working with USA Rugby. Okay. Uh, men and on, women. Like on speed development. On speed development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, 10 years ago, there wasn't, I mean, speed coaches were not like a popular thing. Like mm -hmm. I think a couple NFL teams had speed coaches. Um, but I was a player, so I was in the pool, just not very good. So when it came time for me to like move on, I was kind of like, hey, can I intern? Like, can I be around? Um, so they're, they were kind of looking for a role for me. And teaching was always my thing. Like, I remember being the worst person on the team, but being able to describe very well what the task was to mm -hmm. my other teammates. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of had a leadership quality too, but my mom was a teacher, art teacher. You know, she always taught me the process of teaching. So like, when I, even when I was on the team, wasn't very good, but I could teach guys things. So mm -hmm. I was trusted in that, in that sense. So I was brought on to teach speed. And essentially like what I was doing at first was like pretty archaic. Like I think, I thought speed was just technique. So I'm out there, with, and this is like a couple of years before the Olympics, me trying to figure it out. Like everyone's doing technique, 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 like two reps are running. And that was it. Like it, it, it was good. It was good quality. Um, you know, looking back, I kind of cringe, but um, that was- That's like, how it should be. That's yeah. how you know that you've grown. Right. That's the thing is a lot of people just stay in that mindset. Right. That, you know, that's how I was. I was archaic. You mentioned- you know, how do you run faster? How do you jump higher? Well, squat more. And then if that doesn't work, okay, squat more and get more flexible. Mm -hmm. That's where I was at one point when right. I started and then you grow. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's huge for coaches is being able to not have that ego of like, Hey, I was wrong. Then I right. moved on. I got better. Right. And every year you look back and you transformed something in your program. Yeah. hundred percent. Cause like it was 90% technical stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and what I realized is like, there's, that's how I learned. So I, I wanted to take my my style of learning and put it on everyone. But not everyone was really to, willing to go home and like read about it and understand it and practice it and obsess over it. Mm -hmm. So I had to find different ways to communicate and different ways to get the same result that weren't as complex. And it had nothing to do with me looking like an expert. I think as I get older now, I'm looking at like, how can I be as simple as possible? So they're like, not even sure what I do, but they know the result is like mm, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, for sure. That's a big key right there actually, because a lot of times, like when you're getting into it and you're learning the details, you want to just spew out all the details. Right. You want to tell everybody, you want to show everybody how much you know. Right. And that could possibly be the worst thing for the athlete yeah. because yeah. then they're becoming these overthinkers. 
And the, the classic quote is the more you think, the slower your feet get. Yeah. And um, so then eventually you for, for me and it sounds like for you, you you kind of learn how to have this filter of let me get the science, let me understand these details, yeah. and then let me give you just the very least. The very basic. If I can yeah. show you and you figure it out and maybe use two words, let's do that. Yeah. And then if I have to go into more detail, we'll do it. But 100%. that's a good point is like kind of being, um, I guess you would call it a hands-off practitioner where it's, I'm not here like trying to show you how to do everything. I'm just here to nudge you in the right direction. Yeah, because yeah. like, I, I, I think every coach goes through it. At the beginning of your career is like, you're also building your confidence mm -hmm. and like kind of feeding your ego because yeah. your friends think you're a gym teacher and like you're not. <laughs> so like you're trying to explain to your mom and your mom's like telling your family, like, oh yeah, Les is a great gym teacher out in California. And like, <laughs> right. So you're trying to prove like, like, oh mom, hold on, I know all this stuff. Yeah. Like, it's some of that. Yeah. Then once you kind of settle in, you realize like, all right, well, you know, this is actually a lot simpler than I, than I thought mm -hmm. and really, you know, have the relationship, but then get the outcome and mm -hmm. you don't have to get to the outcome by proving that you're the greatest. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. That's an important point. Um, so then how do you go from you're at, you're at the Olympic training center, you're training these high level athletes. How do you get into football? Yeah. Good question. So while I was at the Olympic training center, this is like semi-embarrassing story but i'm gonna tell it anyway <laughs> it's good that's what we yeah, like yeah, that's what so we like i'm at the olympic training center i'm training the teams um first of all like i, I hope people don't think you make a lot of money working mm -hmm. with the olympic mm -hmm. team <laughs> you don't you really don't and um so i'm doing like little side things so my friend was training for the nfl um we grew up in dc together and we're training and he's like yo like i'm gonna go run routes for this guy george whitfield i was like yeah i'll come out obviously like i'm not a football player i wasn't running routes so I'm out there and I'm just like trying to stay active. I'm like, you know, handing water out, like picking up cones, whatever, just helping out. And I'm literally out there, like I'm going there like every other day for months. And um, one day, like, I guess one of the coaches didn't show up and George George came up to me and like asked my name. I was like, I'm Les. And he's like, oh, can you warm these guys up? I was like, yeah. So I warm everybody up and um, like I do a pretty good job. And he's like, what do you do? I was like, well, you know, I'm a coach. He's like, oh, okay, well, what kind of coach? I'm like, well, I coach Olympic rugby and I just like said it and he's like what he's like you've been out here three months you never told me you're an Olympic speed coach I was like well I never thought of it that way and like I had such low confidence in my coaching career mm -hmm. because at the time I was making no money and like sometimes when you make no money you think my value must be that low yeah so he's like yo you're an Olympic speed coach you never said anything all right cool well this is what you're gonna do you're gonna train these guys you're gonna do this whatever so I started working with them. Um, he sent me like a D2 guy, you know, to train for the combine that year. And like that dude actually did really well. And he's like, oh, okay, I think there's something to this. So 2017 was the first year that I did combine training on my own. And it was the first time I ever like recruited a guy and got him to come. And it was a quarterback from Oregon, Dakota Prukop. And Dakota, I trained like that spring and he came out and he could have trained with anybody in the world. And he's like, Les, I'm coming to train with you. And mind you, Dakota and I are still best friends to this day, like amazing friends. So he came and trained with me. He did really well. He told his friend. He brought another guy. Now all of a sudden I have like a couple guys go to the NFL, a couple more guys go to the NFL, a couple more guys. So it started to build. Um, I think I had three athletes 2017, then I had 18, 2018, then I had 28, 2019. Wow. It just kept building. It kept building. And um, I mean, the goal really was like I realized like if I go – deeper than I go wide. So like if I go all in on this one athlete and he becomes incredible, or he doesn't, it doesn't matter, he's still gonna be the person that's gonna go out and spread the news. Mm -hmm. Like I don't need to market, I don't need to you know, have agent relationships yet, I just need to do a good job and all that stuff will come. So I was super patient. Um, you know, I, I was doing things for very cheap at the time and I realized like my, my real value is relationships. Mm -hmm. So those one or two relationships grew to 50. And now, you know, we have close to 50 guys in the league. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was, it was raw. I mean, at the time, like, I think when I was doing the NFL stuff, I was driving all over the place, sleeping in my car, trying to figure it out. You know, like, I think I was training a couple of kids in the morning, a couple of kids at night to pay for my gas to go place to place. Mm -hmm. But yeah, relationships is kind of what built it all. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And so now you get some top uh, picks. I mean, you get some some um, well-known names now. Yeah. Um, and so when they're coming in to the combine and, and for anybody who's not familiar with the NFL combine, 
speed matters. Yeah. NBA combine, man, I've transformed some three quarter court <laughs> times and nobody knows because yeah. nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, and NBA combine people, unless you just jump like 46 inches, yeah. they don't care. It's not going to move the needle. But um, NFL, we're talking about, you know, you a couple milliseconds, yeah. a, a millisecond. That's that's a difference maker. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what are some kind of results that people see when they come to you day one until they get to the NBA or to, to the NFL combine? Yeah, well, I mean, generally we'll see over the past three years, we're looking at 0.25 or more mm. uh, second difference. And that's huge. Yeah, and it's massive. So the the reason why that we, we get that result is because every athlete we train has been an individual program. Mm. Every single one that's ever come through ours. Um, you know, we don't take a really general approach. Like there's our general things within that. But as far as loading, as far as volume, as far as individualization every athlete's different mm -hmm. every athlete's different so we've seen a ton of success we've also seen some guys not improve it's so like early on in my career i i was still experimenting and i couldn't figure out why some got faster and some didn't and that's kind of where we we started researching and developing and researching and developing and then over the years we started to kind of hone in on okay what's our process and once we got our process tighter we started seeing every athlete improve Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's truthfully, it's pretty simple. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's kind of like, if you want to improve somebody for their squat, there's like several things you do and that's known, but in sprinting, it's not so common sprinting. There's like a million different philosophies mm -hmm. and none of them are really based on actual science and facts. And like, so that's kind of what we dived into trying to understand that complexity of sprinting and yeah. seeing some good results. And what are some kind of basic things that you got to check the box on as far as improving somebody's speed because some people would think like hey all i got to do is just go run yeah um you know what are the kind of the things are there some certain like things that you're trying to check off yeah um the most important is just horizontal force mm -hmm. we talked about like how vertical force is, is directly related to vertical jumping so if you want to have a good vertical jump you have to develop vertical force vertical power um, for sprinting it's horizontal force Acceleration is essentially um, your t your peak velocity minus your initial velocity divided by time. Mm -hmm. So we're lo really looking at how do you get to that peak velocity? How long does it take? Most athletes that we see come out from college have poor acceleration in terms of reaching that max velocity in a timely manner. Some athletes reach it too soon. Some athletes reach it too late. So when we map an athlete, the major thing that we see deficiency-wise is horizontal force. Mm -hmm. So what, what that means is that some athletes come in, they can squat 600 pounds, but their horizontal ratio of force, meaning like their horizontal side of that force or the resultant force is actually lower than their vertical force. So they're not able to produce that force over the, over the course of five yards, for example. That first five yards can account for 40% of the entire velocity of your run. So if you're missing that zero to five mark, you might be off by 0.15 seconds just on that zero to five mark. So what we've seen is like we improve athletes early acceleration, first four contacts. We've seen massive improvements. Then from there, we look at, okay, how do we get your acceleration to match up to what you're actually running? So some athletes come in, run track. Okay, you're fast. You can hit 23 miles per hour, but it takes you six seconds to get there. So how do we access that speed a little bit earlier? Mm -hmm. So it's just manipulating different forces to get that same, uh, to get a, a, an efficient run that's based on how much ground reaction force we're producing and what direction that force is going. Right. Yeah. yeah, we see it all the time in basketball. You get some guys with over 40 inch verticals and you're like, okay, you have the requisite fast twitch fibers mm -hmm. to be really fast. I mean, you got the tendons to be fast. Everything is there, it's inside of you, but you produce everything vertically yep. and you can't get the right shin angles to apply force yep. horizontally. Exactly. Um, and so for that guy, getting him in for, to do some speed mechanic drills, I think can make a, a, a huge difference and just getting them used to sprinting because basketball yeah. players, they don't sprint. Yeah. I mean, we, we accelerate a couple steps and then we decelerate, we change yeah. directions. And even me, I, uh, I'm somebody who studies this stuff, but I look back at my journey and I never worked on speed yeah. and I look back at it now. And I think that that's a huge limiting factor that I had, um, especially now seeing how well some of that actually transfers over to other qualities. So when you're building, like we talk about the vertical drills that we uh, were filming for the speed code, 
And I was mentioned to you, I think there's a lot of carryover just to the vertical force that we're producing in jumping. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have 0.2 seconds to make contact with the ground and spring off. Mm -hmm. And so we need that ankle stiffness. We need that foot stiffness. Yeah. And a lot of that I feel like can be built through some of these drills that oh, we actually do sure. in the speed code. For so sure. I think there's more carryover between vertical jumping and sprinting than people even think. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at vertical jump training and sprint training, you look at them as special strength training programs, then it, it makes a little bit more sense because a lot of people look at the weight room as one thing, they look at jumping as one thing, sprinting as one thing, but they're all the same. We're, mm -hmm. all, we're working on ground reaction force. How do we apply force to the ground? What direction do we apply it? Um, and what's the result of it? And, and if you look at it in that way, you start to analyze every drill is either adding to that or building the capacity to, to hit the ground harder, mm -hmm. to push the ground harder, to push away harder. Yep. Yeah. What are your thoughts on strength and conditioning? I mean, what strength work, loading up heavy. Um, do you see it transfer over? I mean, I've heard a lot of track coaches say what happens in the weight room stays in the weight room. I've heard some others say, hey, I mean, it's going to help us with acceleration as long as we're doing enough speed work to, yeah. to match it. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, so I think weight room is necessary. So what I think is like, it can, it can develop result in force, so that total force number. So if I can produce 1,200 newtons of force and I get 60% of that to turn over to horizontal, then that's great. But if I start off with 800 uh, newtons of result in force, then 60% still won't move the needle. Mm -hmm. So I think the weight room is necessary. Now, some athletes, for example, are, are more force dominant than others. So some athletes come in and they have a great prerequisite of strength. So there might be some different things they need to work on. Um, but I do feel like max strength does have does have a place from a central nervous system standpoint. Mm -hmm. So um, potentiating number one, number two, just developing the qualities to produce force, keeping the ner nervous system firing. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think the weight room is is a lot of track coaches um, shy away from it. But the truth is is that we're building the result in force, and they have to be able to transfer that onto the track. Right, you're not going to transfer it just from body weight sprinting because. When you sprint, the force capability of the force exposure and the power exposure that you have during sprinting is is milliseconds. It's short. Mm -hmm. You reach your peak power in a sprint within you know 0.8 to, to one second. And then you you only hold it for a fraction of a second. Mm -hmm. So there's not enough exposure around peak power, peak horizontal power to create an adaptation. Mm -hmm. So if we're not doing sled loading, resisted running, those types of things. We're not going to get an adaptation from the weight room onto the track to develop speed. Right. So there's a disconnect. So coaches that say weight room doesn't help speed, no, they're they're right because there's there's actually a gap in the middle. Yeah. And you have to fill that gap with things that are individual to that athlete to develop the horizontal qualities, or mm -hmm. it's not going to transfer over. Right. Yeah. Hundred percent. That's that's a lot how I often break it down because people go get stronger in the weight room. They're like, oh, I'm not faster. I don't jump higher. I'm like, yeah, that's just your potential. Yep. That in no way guarantees that you're going to jump higher, run faster. Right. Now we got to bridge that gap. Right. Um, let's talk about some speed mistakes. So I get on Instagram, I scroll through, and I see NFL players doing some stuff that just doesn't seem like it's working for yeah. them. <laughs> uh, let's talk about maybe what are some of the most common mistakes when people are trying to get faster? Oh, man. Uh, too much volume, number one. Mm. So... I see athletes running, you know, 60s, 80s, 100s, 110s, way too much volume. Most athletes hit their peak velocity within, they hit 90% within 15 yards, about 92% at 20 yards. Some, some athletes, it's 90% at 20. So really, I mean, maybe by 25 yards, it, they've hit their peak velocity. They can only hold it for maybe a second, and then they decelerate. So all that over distance really is just practicing bad mechanics. Yeah. You know, the brain is essentially piece of clay and you're molding it continuously with your actions so when you're molding you know 80 yards of bad running form times 10 you're looking at 800 yards total volume of poor sprinting mechanics mm -hmm. so it's not going to transfer the only transfer you're going to have is essentially poor mechanics poor posture and injury so that's number one is um is volume so thinking speed and condition are, are, are linked yep you don't need to run 200s 400s especially you know you don't need to do that. Yeah, and it's okay <laughs> yeah. to take some rest periods. Yeah, like, rest periods. Go get fresh, and then let's go back, and let's do right. it again. Right, right. So, you know, we look at sprinting the same way we look at max strength in the weight room, full recovery periods, mm -hmm. short distances, minimal effective doses, always, mm -hmm. always. We don't 
you know, it's actually worse to do more than it is to do less. Yeah. In sprinting. Yeah, yeah, yeah for, for sure. sure. You can get some gains by doing a little bit, to, n like not enough. Right. Right. You, you might not be maximal, but like there's, there's some value in minimal dose work of yeah. just going out and let me get 15 minutes of work here and there. Yeah. It may not be the best stimulus, but it's a stimulus. But when you go above and beyond and you get too much of a stimulus, your body just shuts down. Yeah. And that yeah. stimulus is too far out of reach, you can't adapt. Exactly. And then the result is just injury. Exactly. In yeah. Fatigue and injury. Yeah. Um, what are some other common mistakes? What about you know training on the sand? You see that all the time, NFL players out there, yeah. daily sand training. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, and without calling, I don't want to call anyone out, but like, there, when you sprinting is about ground reaction force. So when you're when you're sprinting against a surface that doesn't have a stable surface, like your foot's going into the ground and the force is dissipating out, you're no longer working speed. Mm -hmm. So you might be conditioning specific strength. You might be doing low intensity plyos, that's fine. But if you're looking to get a speed ad adaptation, it's not gonna happen, not even at a muscular level, because mm -hmm. um, we're looking at, we're looking at how we hit the ground and we're looking at how we rebound off the ground. And that doesn't happen in sand. So, yeah. Um, we, we will go to the beach and we will do some sand stuff. We'll do plyos. We'll do um, you know, some fun things, recovery things. But as far as adaptations for speed, you're, you're not going to get it from yeah from sprinting in the sand. 100%. Yeah. It is fun, and it provides some vibes. Mm -hmm. So I still take my guys to the beach every now and then. Um, but I did probably about five years ago just get away from doing our speed work there. It just makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of things. Like, one, sand is going to um, make it more muscle dominant, and you're not going to get any tendon. Right. So right. you you don't load the tendon. So that mus muscle tendon interaction is actually very different. Mm -hmm. And I then then you would get on normal ground. I think that actually messes some people up. And then also if you look at the angles when you're doing like a sharp change of direction in sand, you're gonna have upright angles because yeah. if you actually had a good horizontal shin, you would slip so in it, sand. Mm -hmm. And so it it uh, reinforces upright patterns, upright right. sprinting, right. upright change of direction. Right. And if we're looking for more horizontal force for acceleration, mm -hmm. if I'm looking for deceleration, horizontal force the other direction, exactly. I don't want to be on, you know, an unstable surface right. for that. Right. Yeah. So I think I think that is that's definitely one common error. Um, any other big common mistakes that you see? Because you're in the trenches, and I think that's that's something that's unique about you. You're in there with the top NFL players. Olympic athletes, but then you also have a school yeah. and you're working with youth yeah. athletes. Yeah. And, and so yeah. not a lot of people have that balance of both. And so you have a good pulse on where the industry's at yeah. because the guys who are training the top guys, that's where they are. Right. And right. they don't look down to the youth. And mm -hmm. so um, some people get removed from where speed, the speed training yeah. or like in my industry, vertical jump training, they get removed from the culture yeah, yeah. and you're entrenched, you're there in yeah. the trenches. So yeah. um, any other mistakes that you see, maybe for like little kids, maybe your, your seventh, eighth grade kids. Yeah. Um, it's funny. Cause like these kids will, eighth graders will come to me and be like, coach, can we do over speed coach? Can we do hmm. stadiums coach? Can we do this? And like, I understand there's a cool factor to everything. And a lot of times, especially cause of Instagram, a lot of these kids are exposed to a ton of stuff on Instagram. Yep. So on Instagram, they see the parachutes, they see the overspeed, they see all these things, and it's just like they neglect the basics. Mm -hmm. So I would say anything that doesn't focus on posture and basics and horizontal force development. So you can put overspeed in that category. I do I do use overspeed with my top guys, um, but you have there's a prerequisite to overspeed. Yeah. So if you can't dribble, if you can't do basic patterns, if you can't stabilize your, your pelvis, you're not doing overspeed. Mm -hmm. And then when well, I see people do overspeed, they have these bungee cords that pull you at like 30% faster than your, your velocity. Cause you, you can't Yikes. track it. Like if you're not using a 1080, yeah. it's almost impossible to track what your velocity is and how much faster it's pulling you. So I actually didn't do overspeed for three years because I couldn't afford a 1080. Mm -hmm. So I just stopped doing it. Yeah. Now that I have a 1080, there's like some guys that I will, okay, you, you, you can do overspeed, you can do overspeed, you can't. And, um, so anything that's not based around like a technical model of improving posture and force development, throw it out. You know, you, you don't need like there is footwork drills you should do. And there is plyos you should do. But if you're looking at strictly speed development, you want very, very, very low amounts of volume and a high focus on posture. You can yeah. add volume through drills. You can add volume through hill runs or things like that. But 
you don't need to do a ton of sprinting. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It, it's a marathon. Yeah. These young kids, they just want to hop. They want to hop to that top level so fast. So fast. And it just ruins them. I mean, it ruins them because they don't have that base. But then also it's like, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. you, now you're a junior in high school and you've done every advanced training. How are you going to get a stimulus to improve now? Right. You're peaked. Right. You're done. Right. Right. So, yeah, that's we we see that all the time um, in basketball players. Um, I, I was curious on the the overspeed stuff. Um, is there a certain like cutoff of of assistance that you would want? Is it like like super light? Is it ten percent or um, like Matt Ray at Alabama is taking guys to twenty percent? Mm. He has a very special population of athletes um, that I see very. I see some good guys, but I never have long enough with them. So mm -hmm. I would say like I cut off at like maybe ten percent over speed. But generally, three to five is kind of where it lives. I yeah. just want a little bit faster. Just a tiny bit. Tiny bit, because it's more of a neural adaptation. Mm -hmm. and most of the adaptations you get from overspeed are the brain saying, okay, it's okay to be this fast. Yeah. Um, and it, it remembers how it contracts. It remembers how it feels. And you take that and you, you turn it into actual, you know, free running. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's more what I'm looking for rather than like a adaptation that's physiological. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And I'm... 100% on board with with overspeed training in, in vertical jumping it's a lot easier because if you make a mistake you don't get hurt right, so like right. okay if you know you see people with the thick bands and the things just pulling them up and that you're not applying any force that band is just pulling right, you up you're right. deloaded by 50% like I'd rather see you at a 10 to 20% but you don't get hurt now overspeed training if if you're getting pulled by 40 50 percent mm -hmm. at some point you're going to face plant face plant, and so like the injury. the injury risk goes up so much more with overspeed sprinting yep. than it does overspeed jumping 100 yep. percent. yeah and i've seen guys like fully rip their hamstring before the Oof. combine oh my before god before the combine and top guys like yeah i've seen some guys like fully rip their hamstring and doing overspeed and you know it's not always the coach's fault like you just don't know how much is being applied and if that guy can handle that eccentric force mm -hmm. into the ground because these guys are break there's so much breaking forces yeah as they as they contact especially if they're over 200 pounds like mm -hmm. even 180 pounds is a lot like, mm -hmm. a lot of forces into the ground so a lot of guys can't handle that especially if they're landing in front of their center of gravity mm -hmm. and, and they're putting that foot out there so there's definitely prerequisites like i've done a ton of dribbles over speed so like an ankle dribble over speed. Yeah. So it's forcing you to put that foot back to the ground. So it's mm -hmm. neural knee dribble over speed. The velocity is actually not that high, but we're assisting you to get to velocity. So it's not as um, it's not as muscular. There's not as much of a muscular demand from it. Yeah. Yeah. So and so like your limbs are over speed, but like your body's not moving right, super fast. Right, yeah. Right. Okay. And then w any thoughts on like. Uh, like going down a decline, yeah. like no band or anything, but say like I got a 10, 10% decline. Yeah. I, um, I've shot away from, I, I'm, I guess I'm more simple than, mm -hmm. than, than anything. Um, and I've taken calculated risks. I've done some downhill and then I've had some guys with some anterior issues. Like, mm. um, you know, I've had some guys with some tendonitis. Yeah. It only takes like a couple of those for me to be like, ah, I don't know. Yeah. Cause you have to be so technically sound. Now there are a lot of athletes that can handle it. Like my little sister at Oregon, Elisa Hickey, she could, she could do downhill. She could do over speed. She could, you could have a car puller. Yeah. And her mechanics are going to be fine. Yeah. She's one of the people you could drop into a 22 mile per hour treadmill and she would just go, mm -hmm. go, go. She can't run 22, but she, her foot's directly under her. Mm. Cause she's worked with me for years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done a little bit, like I'll do drills over speed. I'll do drills downhill. I'll do, I'll experiment in drills, but when it comes to running, generally I'm just like run. Mm. There, there isn't, there isn't much sexy stuff when it comes to it. Right. Yeah. So as far as injuries go, I mean, hamstring injuries are so common yep. in sprinting. As soon as you get guys at max velocity, hamstrings are common now, especially in basketball because sprint mechanics are so poor. Yep. If we get guys really going fast, you see a lot of hamstring injuries. Any um, like quick tips on the surface to prevent those hamstring injuries? Yeah. Um, most, most hamstring injuries, the, the mechanism is, is caused by excessive backside. Mm. So it's, it's through the swing phase where that hamstring injury happens or it's on contact. Both are caused by similar things. So it's usually caused by that foot leaving the ground then kicking back towards the butt before the hip comes forward. Um, yep. A lot of this is caused by the position of the pelvis. So the pelvis is anterior. 
um, it causes just the backwards motion to kind of happen naturally. Um, it's momentum, essentially. It's, it's, you're in the wrong position, so it's throwing that leg behind you, and then you swing it forward. By the time you swing it forward, the hamstring's just trying to decelerate that leg, but it's swinging through so fast, and a lot of injuries happen that way. And then usually when that happens, you land in front of your center of gravity. So for, the, for most um, basketball players, I see they have some type of anterior tilt, which is natural. Most, most athletes do. Um, but trying to control that as a sprint is, is really the key. Mm -hmm. So building the strength through there, so aligning their posture, um, number one, breathing techniques to kind of like get their psoas and diaphragm all, all together and working together and relaxed and stable. Um, and then building the strength around the hips, massive. Mm -hmm. So like we talk hip flexor drills, we talk th those types of things. For me, hip flexor drills, um, glute bridges, those types of things are built around stabilizing the pelvis. That's my main goal with every athlete is can I stabilize their pelvis? If they can stabilize, they can handle more speed. They can handle more velocity. They're going to be better technically. If I don't teach them anything else and I find a way to stabilize, uh, we call it lumbopelvic control. If they mm -hmm. can do that, then there's other things I'm going to teach them, but they're all offshoots of that one thing. Right. So that's kind of our focus, but which is huge. I I've been going through, um, the program the, I've been going through the speed code and you know, those, those, um, the warm up drills, it just gets your, your hip flexors burning and it just gets your, you know, your glutes and your hip stabilizer muscles mm -hmm. and your feet stabilizers. And, um, it's so important because I think a lot of us who don't have that found the, that foundation of sprint mechanics, you know, you want to move with the quads, you want to move with the hamstrings. Right. You're not necessarily moving proximally closer to your right. core right. with your hips. You're moving more distally. And that's a huge uh, mechanism of things like ACL injuries yep. as well. Yep. Uh, if we can't get those hip flexors working, we're going to try to do hip flexion with the quads right. too much. Right. Um, and so there's some, some huge injury implications there. And I just feel like the uh, the hip flexor training has never been done the right way. Right. Um, in basketball is we load them up with like some bands and it just doesn't really hit the right way. And with bands, you're not getting tension until you're at the very top. Right. Right. So right. you're strengthening that very top range, but you're not strengthening what's happening exactly. from bottom exactly. to, to top. Yeah. Um, and then going through these sprint drills, I'm like, I'm getting the same burn in the hip flexors as I am with those band drills. Yeah. And this yeah. is actually more specific more to specific. what we're going through. Yeah. I see a lot of people load the mid thigh. Um, and essentially what, what happens is now we're working a lot of rectus femoris. Mm -hmm. And when we think about lifting the knee, uh, when athletes lift the knee, it actually pulls them into a tilt. Yeah, the pelvis and it pulls them out of position. Mm -hmm. As soon as that happens, it, you, you throw off every mechanism. You throw off your entire. I mean, technique is essentially posture. Yeah, like that's that's all it is. Like when we do drills, it's literally cueing your posture and building specific strength. Right. Um. Like we we don't we do banded, you know, some banded hip flexor stuff, but like most of the work we do is just drill, drill, mm -hmm. drill, and those drills are going to build the specific strength and the postures that you need to be in. And um, they're very, very, very specific. That's why I call it special strength. It, right. it is special strength. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Um, and then let's just talk a little bit about your the horizontal profiling stuff that you're doing because that's super unique. It's actually very similar to what I do um, with our vertical um, assessments. Um, talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So we um, it's been a long journey doing this, but essentially we started out using force plates way back and looking at the ratio of horizontal force to vertical and then figuring out okay where should this switch over um, how much force do we have how much velocity do we have what's the relationship or power um, in this run so what we did over the past couple of years is then transfer that to lasers so we're looking at through split times what's the horizontal force what's the vertical force what's the ratio of that um, but more most recently we've looked at using gps units so We've programmed GPS units to read force velocity profiling for us. And then we're actually taking that, looking at the bucket. So how much force are they producing? How much velocity are they producing? How much power are they producing? How fast is that horizontal ratio of force drop to vertical? Um, and then we're able to look at athletes as a whole, as a team, and then create buckets for each athlete. Mm -hmm. So if the athlete's not producing a lot of horizontal force, we bucket them with a, with a physiological drill, um, like resisted run, and then a technical drill. Maybe it's some lumbo pelvic control, maybe it's an A march, maybe it's an A switch. 
Um, so we're building these profiles, but also we have a drill library to kind of insert the athlete into a prescription based right. model. Right. Um, but what we're seeing is actually interesting is that majority of the athletes that we have can produce decent velocity once they get to a high level. Most of those athletes that we've seen are deficient in being able to produce high amounts of horizontal force. So what I mean by high amounts is producing 60%, 55 to 60% or more uh, ratio of horizontal force to vertical at the start. So we see athletes that can produce force, but at the start, they're not capable of producing that force horizontal. So it's the same as if none of us ever squatted, went in a weight room and we're like max squat. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to perform well because we haven't, that hasn't been a consistent stimulus in our programs. So even right. athletes at the NFL level, at the Olympic level, we're seeing they haven't had a lot of exposure to training this way. So we're seeing huge gains in athletes in a short amount of time. Like what we did in eight weeks, we're now doing in four weeks, mm -hmm. truthfully. Like, and it's not rocket science. Like it's actually simpler. I coach less, I sleep more. Like, you know, right. honestly, like it's, um, it, it's, it's more of a, it's less guesswork. Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning I did so much because I'm like, if I throw a thousand things at this athlete, like five of them are going to work and hopefully they're the five I need. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like, I only need these five things and I'm going to do them and I'm doing really well. And then I'm going to step out the way and we're seeing huge increases. Yep. Yeah. That's big time. Um, what are some of the, the, the fastest athletes that you've worked with? Like, uh, w give me the fastest for everybody. Everybody has context behind 40 times. Yeah. So, so give me what, what's the fastest 40 time you've ever seen? Um, well at the combine the past couple of years, I've seen some fast ones like rugs ran four, two, seven, but I've seen like on our, on our own system, I've seen a four, two, seven. Wow. Laser from wow. Carlin house. He, he plays rugby. Jeez. Yeah, he's freakish. And like, can yeah. rugby players hang with NFL players speed wise? Um, the three rugby players that I have that are the three fastest are faster than any NFL player I've ever had. Really? Any. Yeah, That's they incredible. All run. Carlin runs 25.7 miles per hour. Wow. 25.7. Um, Perry runs 23.78. Kayvon runs 23.5. Wow. All on the same team. And they'll all be on the field at the same time sometimes. That's crazy. Yeah, they're freaks. Because truthfully, they're lighter than the average football player. Hmm. So the average football player produces more horizontal power per unit of body weight than these guys because they, the football guys are heavier yeah. generally mm -hmm. I mean, other than, you know, some, some of the guys out there, but these guys, number one, their demands, they have to sprint further. Um, their, their average run where they, you know, score will be like 40, 50 meters, you know, or the average run in NFL is like, 10, 8, right. 6, 5, you know, it, it's shorter. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen is that our football guys can produce high amounts of force in relation to the rugby guys, but the rugby guys can produce a higher velocity. Mm. So they, they, they're they constantly getting those high velocities. So those three rugby guys, yeah, faster than any NFL players I've had. Wow, that's cool. I never yeah. I never knew rugby guys are that fast. Yeah, yeah, rugby sevens. So yeah, seven guys on a field, you know, right. soccer field level. So mm -hmm. it, they can run. As far as football, like what are the fastest players, um, like position wise, that you typically see? Yeah, corners and corners have corners have always had a better excel, and I guess it's the demands always coming out of the break and excelling. Um, so we've seen a lot of really good accelerations from those guys, and then uh, receivers. Our receivers have a really good. DRF, which is the decrease in ratio of force. So they have a better transition mm. and they can hit a higher velocity. So what we've seen is like. Uh, so by that, you mean like a better transition of you hold horizontal longer before you get to vertical? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So if you look at receivers, their zero to five split, most of the guys we've had has not been as fast as the cornerback zero to five split. Mm. But the overall velocity has been higher. Mm. So. And I think it's probably because they do so many reps where they come off the line and they're not at a maximal sprint, but then they turn it on. So they're used to developing speed a little bit later, whereas yeah. corners always coming out of a break, full maximal sprint. Yeah. You know, that could be it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And they're doing thousands of reps of that their entire lives. So yeah. That could be it. Um, but yeah, we've, we've profiled a ton of corners and their peak power is almost the same as 
a wide receiver. But like I said, their force is higher with the cornerback position. Their velocity is lower. And then the receivers, their velocity is higher and their force is lower. Mm -hmm. But it, they, it's almost the same peak power, same times. Right. So. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'm I'm so excited to get some of my hoopers on this program because I've always been telling them, like, hey, defensively, we, like we should be training like a corner. Mm -hmm. Like corners are some of the most athletic humans on earth. Yeah. And like we should be training like, like offensively, train a lot like receivers. Yeah. Um, but but hoopers just do not have anywhere near that level of speed, that level of explosiveness. And so getting them into some speed work is going to be a game changer because yeah, sure. historically, like Hoopers just don't do it. Yeah. We yeah. don't do any type of real speed work. So I'm excited to see what we can do. I got a seven foot NBA guy who I keep telling him every day. I'm like, you're a corner. You just <laughs> happen to be seven foot. Yeah, yeah. And, and like they, we need that level of speed and we need that mentality. Um, so I, I'm excited to try to transform the, the Hoopers athleticism. But uh, look, tennis, I'm yeah. talking baseball, yeah. like every sport, every sport, speed can take you to the next level. Every sport. Um, and, and in so many sports, it is the limiting factor of yeah. how far you'll go. Yeah. Like in basketball, we always talk about height. Well, height doesn't matter if you're fast enough. Now, if you are six foot and you are not extremely fast, yeah, you're probably going to be limited. But if you're six foot and you're stupid fast and you can get to positions, you know, quicker, um, you're going to have a shot. And then, yeah. of course, we need the skill component and everything's got to be married together. But majority of hoopers are told that they can no longer play because of something physically or yeah. from an athleticism yeah. standpoint. And so uh, the, the earlier we can start to take that stuff serious and, and, and let's make sure that we get every ounce of speed out of our bodies that we possibly can. Honestly, yeah. So we're just talking about who can produce more horizontal force is going to win that one yard race. Mm hmm. And it, right now, it's, I think it's the lowest hanging fruit in sports. And I think whoever grabs that is going to start to dominate just a little bit more. Yep. And then it, you know, it's going to change the game. It's going to change every sport, every game. Everything. Yeah. I, always talk, I always talk to my basketball players about if you can beat them with the shoulders, you are what already won. Right. So, like, yeah, we want to continue to separate. But, look, if I can get just that first step on you, and now I can get that leverage and beat you with the shoulders. Now I can put you in jail. You, there's no way you can get back into the play right. as long as I have a little bit right. of skill and I know how to use my body. So it, it's that's all it is. It's just that horizontal force. Yeah. How can I produce horizontal force a little bit better, a little right. bit faster, get myself a little bit further with that first step? Yeah. And historically, basketball players have been, you know, we were talking earlier about the choppy, you know, the, yeah. the hummingbird. It's yeah. like, I just want to move my feet fast, 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 mm -hmm. agility ladder type stuff. Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, they they haven't historically been good horizontal force producers. Yeah. So I'm I'm excited for people to get on this program and uh, you know start taking their athleticism yeah. to the next level. Yeah. Because most people think about speed as velocity. So they're like, mm -hmm. okay, I can run 22 miles per hour. You don't need to run 22 miles per hour in a basketball game. Mm -hmm. You don't. Yep. But you do need to be able to get to 60% of your velocity in two steps, three yes. steps, four yes. steps. Yep. That's important to me. Right. Like, so that's the capacity that I want to develop in you. And that is directly related to force. Early acceleration, first four steps, is direct correlation to how much force you can produce in the horizontal direction. Mm -hmm. And it's it's validated. Yep. You know, just now has been validated, but we're not talking about how fast can you run. It's can you beat this guy mm -hmm. one step, two steps, you know? Right. Yeah, that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, for sure. And um, so in the program, we have strength training covered. We have plyometrics covered. Um, we have agility covered and then we brought in less for the speed stuff and it's just it's such a good uh, uh balance of everything mm -hmm. and, and what a time to be alive you know what i mean yeah. to to go pick up this program and have a 12-week program by two top experts who are collabing to do this like man if we were growing up and we had something like oh, this man. oh my gosh oh, i wouldn't first of all, i wouldn't even be here you like, wouldn't be here you'd probably like watch me on tv or something that's what i'm saying you've been <laughs> you'd be wearing my shoes right now yeah, the pjf honestly, ones right now honestly man <laughs> and that's like funny as we were talking i was like is this too complex you're like oh man like somebody's out there and they want to grab this yep you know yeah like, there's somebody right now that's like been praying for this mm -hmm. you know well and, and and there's so many hungry kids out there who are like man i would do anything to get that combine level training right but right. i don't have an agent who's gonna pay tens of thousands of dollars for that Jeez. and it's like i mean there's juco kids right now listening to this there's high school kids listening to this who are like 
I would do anything. Right. I got the potential. I just don't have the resources. And now you got the resources. It's there. It's, it's there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm so excited to see like, who do we produce out of this? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the story, we're like, man, this kid hits us up. Like I made it here. Mm -hmm. like, All right. Okay. Yep. yep. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I'm excited to do this. Like I said, uh, this is something that I could have done on my own. Like I got enough knowledge to put out a program, but I'm like, look, if, if I want to make this the best, I need the best guy on here. And so less in, in terms of the speed stuff, he, he does a way better job than I could have ever done. And so it's like, look, I got to get him. If he's the best, I need the best. And so I do what I do well. We have the vertical stuff, the strength and conditioning, the agility. And we brought in the, the best of the best for the speed stuff. So you guys got no excuse to not be blowing by people next season. Yeah, honestly, honestly, I'll be pissed if you're not fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be pissed. Yes, sir. <laughs> yep. All right, my man, I appreciate you being on. Uh, we'll, we'll check back in, and, and once the program releases and everything, um, you'll, you'll be hearing more from us. We'll yeah. do some more podcasts. We'll do some more Instagram, YouTube collaborations. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, but, yeah, until next time, we're out. Yeah, peace.